All right, well, hello and welcome back to our immune webinar series. Today we are talking about immune killing foods. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, coronavirus update. Uh, things are not going well in some states. <laughs> so, weird. I know. Who would have thought when you don't follow public health measures, things go differently? So, um, I've haven't like revised my original predictions entirely. Like I didn't really, like I didn't know where we were gonna go. I knew that the numbers would go up if people reopened. That was inevitable. That's just how it works um, because people are out spreading infection. It makes sense that it would go up. It's spiking a little bit harder than I expected it to. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> harder than almost anyone expected it to. Well, and I, th I think that, uh, like, you know, because we've been talking about the numbers a lot, and one of the things that we've kind of noticed is, again, the pandemic should really illustrate a couple of things, and one of the most important things is, and I think this bears out, is number one, we are not as healthy as we think we are, and two, our health care is definitely not as good as some people <laughs> like to think it is. Right. Most of us all, well, most people can agree that our health care sucks, we debate on how to improve it, but I think that the pandemic has made it very clear that um, traditional Western medicine is just not prepared for stuff like this because it's it has no ability to prevent because there is no like drug prevention. I know they were talking about hydroxychloroquine, but it doesn't really make sense to take an immune suppressant when you're before. It kind of makes sense with the cytokine storm thing. Like some people get that's why some people die from it is that their immune system goes so haywire, it's overreactive and it kills them, right. it kind of works for them. Right. So that's where the idea was kind of coming from, but this idea that you take it as like a cure or preventative was never a thing. It doesn't make any sense. Um, there is no there's, drug. There's no preventative drug for any virus. No, because you no. don't actually have an ibuprofen deficiency. You don't need ibuprofen to live. You don't need any of these drugs to live, so there's no need for any of them as like a preventative. What about, what about you know? vitamin Z? Vitamin Z. Zantac. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> but yeah, so, um, but along that line, it bears out our observation and our prediction that things are going to get worse because people are not as healthy as they think they are. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is what we're trying to address with the immune webinar series is to help people figure out where they might be falling short so they can plug the gaps in and, and improve their health. Right. So then when you are eventually exposed, because I think exposure, again, I said this before, I still think it's true. I think that exposure is inevitable. Um, I think so. We have no idea right now. We st it doesn't matter how much you brag about it. Our testing is still <laughs> terrible. Who brags about our testing? Right, nobody. So uh, the testing is still not there. We don't really know. And I don't think we're going to know for years, honestly. Um, in the, we've said this a couple times. We've said it in, in past episodes and in personal conversations with, with you guys. Um, unless we're all doing social distancing, all wearing masks, Unless everybody's involved, you can't guarantee uh, that that you're not going to be exposed by someone. You know, stay, right. stay, you're, you know, who touches the surface at a store and you touch it afterwards, uh, because yeah. our, our, uh, not everyone is compliant. Your odds of being exposed are are even greater. Exactly. Yeah. So right. if you you can, there are still like staying home and you know and doing everything. Wash, washing your home and staying your hands and, <laughs> and all that jazz. But if you um if you do appropriate measures, you can limit your exposure as much as you reasonably can without sure. impacting your life and your health and your happiness too much. But then the other part of like it doesn't matter if you get exposed or if your immune system's strong enough. Um, it would take extreme exposure or multiple exposures or very virulent disease to get through your immune system if your immune system's strong enough. Mm -hmm. People that like like think about COVID and then catch it, they have very weak immune systems. So, and there's, there's a lot of evidence coming out of Europe. My favorite country, Europe. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of evidence coming out of Europe that shows that uh, a number of people are exposed to the virus and never really become symptomatic at all. They're, they um, they're definitely, the, you can see in the antibody testing that they have the antibodies to the disease, so they were exposed, but they never experienced uh, any um, symptoms, then that's not the majority of people, but that's a few, that's a few. Uh, a number of people get symptoms and pop back, and a number of people get the symptoms and unfortunately expire. 
from it. But I want I want to be one of those people who who people's who is exposed and never become symptomatic if that's even possible. That's what yeah. I want to be. Well, because the thing is, again, I don't want to spend too much time on it because we have a lot to talk about. Just, but as far as like antibody testing goes, when you have the antibodies to something and they are adequate levels, it means that you should be immune to it. Mm -hmm if your immune system is working properly because that you've got your defense and they know who they're looking for to beat them up quickly. It's the first time you encounter something when it's new, you don't have the antibodies, you don't have the specific protection. You have your innate immune system, which fights until you build the factories to build the soldiers for this particular disease. That's one of the reasons why you want to keep your immune system as high as possible. If you want to close that door, she's like litter box time. <laughs> so, um, you have your innate immunity, and that has the non-specific response, the response that can go and fight anything and everything. That's critical. Um, but then you need to get exposed to diseases, so then you can build up your acquired immunity, so you have the specific technology for different things. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind like a vaccine, is that if you get a small, uh, minimal exposure to a disease, then hopefully you'll build up your antibodies so then when you encounter the full-blown disease, you're, you are better prepared for it. So it's just strategy and tactics, essentially. But so what happens is that if your immune system isn't working properly, you're not going to be able to make antibodies as easily, et cetera, and maybe not at all. It just depends on what's wrong with you in particular. Um, <laughs> so today we're going to talk about the <laughs> foods that can kill your immune system, which you may want to consider stopping especially or, uh, or limiting or limiting um during this time it's it's one of those things like it, it would be great if you can do this like you know year round but if you can at least be good usually during cold and flu season which is the winter but as uh we are seeing it's not disappearing with the hot weather <laughs> who predicted that I nobody said know. that was gonna happen no no the hot weather was totally gonna wipe it out that's why it's spiking <laughs> in the summertime of july in, in florida, florida. <laughs> In Georgia. And Georgia and Nevada, Texas and Arizona. And Texas and Arizona, right. Yeah, all, no. the, all the hottest states are now seeing spikes. Now, coronavirus does not, like this particular version, COVID-19, does not, it, it, it seems like a flu, but it doesn't act like other flus. It's far more contagious, and it is not, uh, it doesn't seem to, to follow the same pattern of infection that they do. Uh, there is not going to be a cold and flu season as far as covid it's, it's, you get it when you're It's obviously to. coming around all the time. So, yeah. So we'll see what ends up happening, but. So foods, let's look at this broadly. If you have a food that you absolutely love, don't eat it. Hey, thanks for coming, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Let's, let's break it down categorically here. All right. So. So we're going to start with number one. We talked about this uh, last time when we did the truth about carbs. Right, this came up. In, yeah, in sugar carbs. is not your friend. Um, when you consume sugar, you decrease the effectiveness of your immune system by about 50% for two hours following sugar consumption, and it's pretty quick. And then it takes about five hours for your immune system to get back up and running. So you can see that if you're eating sugar constantly throughout the day, you're constantly whacking it down and not letting it come right. back up. Right. So that's one of the reasons why eating sugar regularly is not ideal for your immune system, amongst all the other reasons we talked about sugar the and, other day. And as a, as a nutritionist and, and food expert, yeah, I want to point out any diet plan, which there are many, mm -hmm. that propose that you eat every four, every six, every five hours. Do you see what, what that right. does to your immune system, especially if every – and when we say a sugar-containing meal, that could be – bread or pasta, which convert to sugars in the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. You want to avoid, obviously, table sugar is, is your worst. We, don't, we want to stay away from That's anything from the like wheat that. bread, like we talked about. Wheat bread, and, which is which very high glycemic. So uh, you want to, if you're doing, if you're on some kind of diet plan that has you eating frequently, it may not be the best thing. Maybe it will keep you slimmer, or maybe it meets some other goal, but yeah. it's not the best for your immune system. No, and it's not how we developed or evolved to eat. We didn't eat constantly. We didn't have constant food when we were hunters and gatherers. We ate when we ate, and then we didn't eat because right. then we were hunting again. <laughs> right. So, so we, weren't, we weren't supposed to do this. We're supposed to ebb and flow. You're supposed to be hungry. It stimulates hormones and stuff like that. So when I, just back up for a second. We're going to be talking about... Can you back up? It's, it keeps, close. No, it's, it, yes, because it's doing something weird with the light. Sorry. Don't, 
when you put your hands up to it, it screws it up. I'm Italian. I'm trying my hands together. I can't talk. There you go. <laughs> um, most of the sugar and some of the others we're going to talk about are pro-inflammatory foods. My Cleo's right there trying to get in. <laughs> uh, pro-inflammatory foods, those foods which uh, exacerbate uh, the inflammation response mm -hmm. in the body. And there are a number of them. Sugar, sugar is obviously... Yes, we spent a lot of time talking about sugar and inflammation and how it causes inflammation right. in the body. But sugar is not the only <clears throat> thing that causes inflammation. It's just one of the biggest culprits. Correct. So, like we talked about last time, and I think we made it very clear, if you can keep your chronic inflammation down you're gonna spare yourself from a lot of unnecessary chronic diseases like Correct. cancer, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. Halitosis. That doesn't, that's not that one. Okay. Uh, Brush your teeth. <laughs> um, next on the, in no particular order, next is dairy. Um, if you are lactose intolerant, you know this already. <laughs> um, if you are not lactose intolerant, that doesn't mean that the inflammatory effects of dairy don't reach you. It just means you don't feel them. Mm -hmm. um, you, don't, you don't have any adverse reaction to the sugars in milk, which is uh, lactose. Sugar, uh, sorry, milk is sugar water. That's all it is. Sure. Why does it make little cows into big cows? Right. <laughs> Calorie density, hormones, uh, ho hormones that are in it, all kinds of things that are in it that are really yeah. not You only get You only get people. milk from lactating cows cows that were just pregnant. So what happens is, especially with conventional dairy farming, they keep getting these cows pregnant constantly to keep their hormones up so then they continue to lactate because you you need the hormones to be high enough and then you gotta milk them constantly. If you stop milking them or the hormones come down, they'll stop making milk. So you are, going, you are still consuming the hormones from the cow that are supposed to be going into a baby cow to make it gigantic. So... <laughs> Do you want to look like a baby cow? Yeah, do you want to, exactly. Do you want to look like a baby cow? Um, and when we talk about dairy, it's important um, to understand that there's a lot of things in the dairy section uh, of the supermarket, and mm -hmm. some of those are not dairy. Eggs are not dairy, even yeah. though they're in the dairy section. Dairy means anything that is derived from or made from milk. Mm -hmm. um, are there any safe forms of dairy, doctor? Technically speaking, no. So. End of that conversation. <laughs> there are a couple. <laughs> and technically speaking, no. If you want to go straight up, right. it's better to have no dairy. It's not necessary for your diet. You're not missing out on anything. It's Correct. not. It's like ibuprofen. We don't have a cheese deficiency as much as I love cheese. <laughs> Vitamin C. <laughs> exactly. But there are some forms of dairy that are better for you. Correct. And just to hit on those really quickly, anything that is um, is cultured that doesn't contain sugar. What I mean is. Yogurts. Um, yogurt isn't a bad thing. The problem with yogurt is that almost all yogurt is flavored, and almost all of those flavors contain sugar, sugar which we're trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, there's also there's a thing lately, Greek that yeah. yogurt that is processed to be called Greek yogurt is being sold big time as being healthier. Uh, it, it actually has higher concentrations of lactose in it than regular yogurt does. So if you're looking for the healthier form of plain yogurt, non-Greek plain yogurt is actually uh, better for you than the others. And if, if you really want to go out on a limb, there's a product called kefir. I don't know if you're, it's a Middle Eastern drink. What it is is it's yogurt in liquid form, mm -hmm. and it is very low in lactose, and it's very high in culture. It's much more so than yogurt. Um, I wouldn't drink five gallons of it a day, but if you, if you miss dairy and you really want to have it, uh, kefir is not a, not a bad way to go. If you make smoothies, uh, kefir is a good base for the smoothie. Mm -hmm. Like a less calorie density than say almond milk or some of the other alternatives milks. But um, in terms of cheeses, if you're gonna you if you want to eat aged um, and as much as possible the fewest like like all of our rules the fewest ingredients as possible they have less of the lactose and other things that are going to hurt you. As the doc said, ideally if it came from a cow, don't touch it. Yeah. It's again, it's uh we're talking about least bad at this point. Right. Um, the hard cheeses are the ones that you want to look for, the aged hard cheeses like cheddar and stuff like that. Yep. Anything that's less hard like mozzarella, it's more like milk than not. So like I know because I'm lactose intolerant, I can do like a bit of cheddar, but if I go past like a little bit of mozzarella, it, it will bother me because it's too much like milk. I can't drink milk. I can't eat yogurt. I can only eat like a tiny amount of ice cream. So 
it's just, you know, especially if and most people are lactose intolerant, they just don't realize it. Um, and over time, as we get older and our stomachs change, like uh, when we're younger, we have it gets more, bigger. we have acids and enzymes and stuff like that, things that can help break down the dairy. Mm -hmm. But as we age, our stomach acid goes down and so do our enzyme production and stuff like that. So over time, you'll lose your ability to, to eat milk as well right. or dairy products. So it's a funny thing. The ability to consume milk past age three is a mutation. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We produce... Um, when we're babies, we produce enzymes that break down mother's milk. Of course, yeah. that's what we're raised on. And don't forget, that's our, the, the period at which you were supposed to put on the most weight in the shortest period of time. So still, right? we're still yeah. this is not a great weight loss food. <laughs> but um, do, mother's, mother's milk is broken down by enzymes, digestive enzymes, that we produce in our bodies. By the time you're two and a half, three years old, if you look at cultures that do not typically drink milk past infanthood, those, they shut off. They just, your body doesn't need them anymore, so they stop. Most people of Asian ancestry can't, mm -hmm. can't have milk in adulthood. If you look at Asian cooking, you see very yeah. little dairy, uh, almost, almost none. There's a few recipes in a few places where you will see some, but almost none because uh, Asians, uh, very few Asians have developed the ability to do uh, that mutation that allows you to keep producing those enzymes into adulthood, it's mostly Northern Europeans and uh, Middle Eastern people, as it turns out, and some Well, think African about it, people. these areas where food is more scarce, so you need to be able to, to digest whatever you can consume. The people who could eat the milk from the cows and the goats and stuff managed to survive. And, and on the African mm -hmm. continent, there's only one or two populations that can actually uh, digest milk, and the Maasai mm -hmm. tribe is the, like the most famous, because they basically subsist on goat milk mixed with the same goat's blood. Mm. So, uh, so there you go. Watch for our next episode on, on Maasai cooking. <laughs> so, dairy, yeah, so dairy. Dairy in most of its forms, um, if you're trying to really boost that immune system and not to yeah. be healthier and lose weight, skip the dairy. Yeah, dairy is usually like if you, like we have a couple of big hitters, like if you're trying to lose weight or you're trying to get healthy, eliminating dairy is usually one of the number one things to look out for. Um, it's probably the easiest out of all of these to eliminate. Do you want to tell the dad story? He's not here. <laughs> yes, and who knows if he'll watch it. Um, so I love my dad, and uh, <laughs> he I is, love her dad, too. He's a great guy. He's a good guy, um, but he has been trying to lose weight for a while now, and uh, he has diabetes, so it's harder for him to lose weight at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and I will give him advice from time to time, because we've talked about paleo and stuff like that before, and... Like, but he grew up on a farm in New Zealand, so he's used to like, you know, raw whole milk from the cow and oh, it's the best thing ever. So like, he has been getting whole milk and raw milk as much as he can because he's in New Hampshire. Um, where everything's legal. Where everything's legal, there's no <laughs> rules. Um, but so he's insisted on continuing to drink milk because it's one of his things that he really likes and you gotta die of something. So, <laughs> like dad, but um, He's been trying to lose weight, so he's working out, and he's eating cleaner and all this stuff, and he's doing pretty good. He started doing intermittent fasting, which I was proud of him for doing that. I, I, How much did he lose? He's like, he was over 200 and something, and now I think he's down to like 180. 180-something, yes. Yeah, so so the first 15 of that was just intermittent fasting. Yeah, he did most of it actually with just intermittent which fasting. Which I'm Brian, proud. Yeah, no, it's awesome. It's Not awesome. Easy. Not everyone can uh, figure out intermittent fasting that fast. So um, anyway, so he did that, but he... <laughs> so he uh, he is asking me like you know my weight loss is stalled. What I should I eat fast. What should I do? So I was like, well, you know, you're you're still drinking milk. That's just sugar water. Like if you want, like again, if we're talking about uh, simple rather than easy. Like getting rid of milk is simple. It's very easy to find it on labels and stuff like that. And if you don't eat milk or cheese or yogurt, it's you're fine. And the amounts you're getting in like a pastry or something, which you shouldn't even be eating, but we'll talk about that. Like, you know, if typically when dairy is involved somewhere, you shouldn't be eating the whole thing anyway. But so getting rid of the glass of milk, I knew it would be easier than like retooling other things in his life. So I was like, well, why don't you try getting rid of the milk? He's like, sure. So I was surprised he actually did it because we've talked about milk before, but he stopped. And uh, he uh, immediately, <laughs> within like two days, it he was, called me and was yeah, like, three days later. yeah, so my, so he's diabetic. So his blood sugar is always really high even with the drugs, but 
it started to crash and he was like, I feel terrible. I've got the shakes. I'm tired. And I feel like I'm just tired. Like I can't do this. <laughs> and I was just like, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, I stopped drinking milk. And I was like, what? Because I didn't really think he, like, not that I don't, I love you, Dad, but I didn't think he was going to do it. We didn't think it would be that, that, well. ab that, like, that abrupt and that much. But he, so, that he's where I get my, okay, then let's do it right now. And that's where I get it from, is from learned, my dad. Learned her patience from her dad. So as you can imagine, if this is the amount of, of, your, uh, of sugar-containing foods, carbs, you eat in a day, um, and you're taking three blood sugar medications to bring your blood sugar to here so you don't, die when you bring your consumption down but you don't bring your medication down these are still trying to suppress your blood sugar um, if you're it takes a while to get off of sugar you can't you can't eliminate sugar from your diet and three days later you're done you're gonna feel kind of crappy it's called a detoxing right but it's also called keto flu and, and yeah it's a yeah. withdrawal thing because what happens is your body is sugar withdrawal you're used to fueling on sugar rather than fat, so then when you're trying to switch over, it can be a little bit tough. And then when you add in like pre-diabetes or diabetes, it means that your body isn't um, regulating properly. You don't respond well to insulin. That's why they call it insulin resistance. So, so yeah. So he was still taking his three medications to decrease his blood sugar. So yeah. So like not Steve consuming said, any sugar. So having <laughs> yeah, no it's fuel. Yeah, like pushing it down, and it's <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, you might want to talk to your doctor and see about reducing your medication if this is right. something you want to do ongoingly. But um, but the, the story is to tell you just how much sugar there is in, in milk. milk. Yeah, because I, I know that he's eating other things with sugar, but like the fact that the milk had that much of an impact means that that has been the major source of sugar in his diet for a long time. We're talking two or three glasses of milk a day. That doesn't seem like a whole lot of anything, right? That's mm -hmm. three glasses of milk. So What's imagine, the big deal? And but, then imagine if you're doing two or three cups or – cans of soda a day what is that doing you know orange juice with breakfast yep yeah exactly soda swirling orange candy juice. canes in the orange juice yeah. soda orange juice and milk are all basically the same they're all sugar water um so it's one of those things that if you can just cut it out that's the way okay. to do it what else should we stop eating that's a good question steve beans <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about beans. Um, we're going to beans because we've got we've got some more some more things. But we covered we really covered carbs well last time, and I don't want to overburden that conversation by just repeating it. Beans. Here's the thing about beans. Beans do contain protein, but they are mostly made up of carbohydrate. Right. Um, the the pro and just side note: the protein in beans, the way that they're generally the the way they're processed and cooked in the United States of America these days, that protein is not what we call bioavailable at a very high percentage. So I eat 24 grams of lima bean protein, my body's gonna absorb somewhere between eight to 10 grams maximally. The rest of it is undigestible. Mm -hmm. And the undigestible portion, some of it is fiber, some of it is carb, but and undigestible protein. And that gives beans their they're Reputation. <laughs> yeah, the, the lack of ability to digest them is what is what makes them musical. After all, uh, <laughs> there are other things. Um, there is a substance. There are phytates, um, which is a plant form of phosphorus, which plays havoc with our digestive systems. We're, we're just not meant to try to digest these things. They're also in uh, grains, by the way. Yeah, the phytic acids. They're actually known as an anti-nutrient. So they actually block your body's ability to absorb various nutrition. So like, for example, I, if I remember rightly, the phytic acid especially blocks iron absorption. It does indeed. So if you are consuming a lot of grains, you're not necessarily going to get a lot of iron from your food. So that may be like, so if you have iron deficiency anemia, that could be part of your problem. Right. And the same, and the same with beans. Um, on a, on a scale from, from eh, you know, not so bad all the way to really terrible. The, probably the worst beans you can eat are peanuts, as it turns out. Because they're not nuts, they're beans. They're not nuts, they're beans, right? They're, they're, they're in, the, in the phylum of, of legumes. They're bean. They're really bad. The things that are bad in, in beans are contained in high concentrations in uh, peanuts. Next down the list are, is soy. 
but for a different reason. It, it's not particularly high in, in phytic acids. It's not particularly high in this other substance we'll talk about. Uh, but, what, but it is so badly genetically modified that it actually interplays with your person. The hormones of the plant yep. interact with your hormones and disrupt them terribly, especially mm -hmm. in women. Um, soy consumption has been linked to every lady cancer. There is uterine, ovarian. Yeah, and breast. every male cancer. It's, right, test it. It, it messes with the hormones. Because traditionally in Chinese uh, medicine, we talk about soy being important because it was important. It actually helped with like menopause and stuff like that. That's true. But we're talking traditional soy, the way it was grown before it started being messed with. Mm -hmm. And we'll do a whole talk on GMOs because that's a whole other thing that's a, a huge controversy. You know, <laughs> there's consensus with everyone with a brain that it causes cancer. <laughs> but, you know, Monsanto, they don't, what? Right. No, it's safe. Anyway, but so they've changed, the soy has changed its chemistry, like Steve said, and it just, it does, uh, it messes havoc with your hormones, so it's bad for literally everybody, and it's one of the best things you can take your children off of. And you'll find soybean oil, especially, is in tons of stuff. So like, when you start to read labels, really avoid anything that has a lot of soy or soybean oil in it, because it's all made from the GMO soy. Because almost no soy made in the United States no. is not GMO. No. And so, unless you're going to like get it imported, and you know, how do you really know it's certified no. organic from China? Like, it's you know, tough too. Because I, anybody who's been following our trade problems with China knows that uh, U.S. soy farmers are hurting because we used to export tons of soy to China. Right, so, so they're eating our garbage GMO soy now. So well, how much are they making? Not that, but even more. Actually, even more of a problem for us is the fact that our soy is shipped over there, made into tofu, and sold back to us. Oh, yeah, don't eat tofu. Did you guys know this? I, you may not know this. This is an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of, for instance, chicken is it's killed here, froze, flash frozen, sent to China to be processed, parted, and packaged, and then sent back. It is cheaper to do that than to pay Americans, which you have to pay, in order to do yeah, that you same actually have work. To pay them. <laughs> right, because you've got to pay them actual wages rather than, you know, one yan a year. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, no, and you'll never see your daughter again kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's another, that's a whole other talk, too, is uh, right. we should do a whole one on We're going to do the geopolitics of food. Yeah, it's actually super interesting. And there's a bunch of documentaries on it, too. Um, but yeah. So, yeah, so anyway, so soy is to be avoided, and, and I used to think that I would get soy from China because they're not using American soy. No, I was, I was wrong about that. Yeah, the majority no. of the soy sold here is our soy. Thank you, Monsanto. Yeah, well, they, that. uh, that's a whole other topic. I don't want to talk about Monsanto tonight. That's it's too. It's one of those like, oh God, get that back in we'll there. Be, we'll be here if it's Pandora's box. We'll be here all yeah, night. So, so uh, last thing on, uh, what, last two not, things. Yeah, I was like, not quite done. Don't. don't He's all like, we're almost done. I have something to say. On beans. Right. Yes, I want to talk about beans. But you talk about the rest of the ones in the worst to best. Yes. Two things. One, sapopanins, we didn't mention. Yeah, we, we'll uh, mention it after you finish the list. Okay. Uh, I just mentioned it. Going to continue. Sapopanins, um, if you've ever tried to soak your own beans and seen the bubbles come out of it that look like and feel like soap, sapopanin is, the, is what's uh, in the beans that's causing that. That isn't washed out of the beans, it ends up coating your intestines, yummy, yummy, and makes it very difficult for your body to absorb any nutrients whatsoever. Not to mention, it causes GI distress. Right. Very, very, yeah. yeah that, if you've ever eaten soap, <laughs> it's well, not a good thing. not voluntarily. Right. No, but actually, that's uh, one of the reasons why you got to be careful. Like, if you get um, an upset stomach or diarrhea or something like that, after going to like a restaurant or even at your own home, when your glasses, if they're not fully rinsed out with soap, it's known to do that. Yeah. You might've read horror stories about like an upset waiter will put a drop of soap in someone's like glass of water or whatever. And when they drink it, they... so, so imagine that you're doing that, but like more when you're eating beans. What if they put soap on your duck? <laughs> right? Maybe that's what happened. So on, <laughs> on a, on a Sarah Washington. we started with, uh, we, we went off on a tangent about soy, but soy and peanuts are on the worst end of town, on the more positive end of town. Um, lentils, peas, by the way, your little garden peas, peas are in that same family, but they're pretty much inert. Yeah. Uh, they're fine. They don't contain much of the phytates. They don't contain much of the 
Uh, and then lentils are, are also really low. Um, and it turns out that, that they, the bioavailability of the protein in lentils is a little bit better than yeah, other so beans. Again, it's kind of like the dairy thing. You don't need beans to survive. They, we don't have a bean deficiency. I really don't eat any beans. I never have. I'm very. I think I'm very reactive to them. I've never. I've never liked them. Um, I'll eat peas all day long. Peas don't bother me. But I can do a couple of peanuts. But now I get terrible heartburn. So, uh, so I'm living proof that you don't need beans to live. <laughs> I'd be dead. <laughs> this is true. So yeah. So that's that's beans again. Really minimal positive benefits but a lot, a lot of, of negatives negative and it, like I said, and then with when you add in the GMO and then the last thing I wanted to say about peanuts too, is that one of the other problems with peanuts is that peanuts in this country are fully contaminated with um, aspergillus, yes. which is a microbe, a mold that grows on peanuts. And what happens is that this mold secretes a toxin called aflatoxin mm, yummy. and they can't, they can kind of get the mold off the peanuts, but they can't get the aflatoxin off. It's too small. It's so, virtually impossible to remove aflatoxin. It's basically like a neurotoxin. And what happens is that it can cause a lot of problems and there's no way to remove it. And the FDA is like, well, since we can't get rid of it, then we'll allow you to have this much aflatoxin. Right. So as long as it doesn't exceed a certain level, they won't get in trouble for it. So all peanut products you have to assume in this country have been contaminated with aflatoxin. Mold toxins. Enjoy. Yeah, and we we moved out of an apartment because of black mold, and we were just breathing it. We weren't even eating it. So there is some, and then there is some uh, speculation that uh, people with really bad peanut allergies, it may not actually be the peanuts. It may actually be the aflatoxin, aflatoxin yeah. that they're allergic to, which would actually make a lot of sense. Most people are very allergic to mold. So, right. so yeah, so that's, so if you needed another reason to not eat peanuts or peanut butter, cause it's there too, they're made from peanuts. Um, right. It's weird. Peanut butter is made from peanuts. <laughs> exactly. So we've talked about sugar, yep. dairy, yep. legumes, and now everyone's favorite grains. I'm going to go against the grain here. I don't want to belabor the point because we, we really, we really hit it in the, uh, the, in the carb thing. episode, but just to touch on a couple of things. One, those same phytic acids, the same phy uh, phytates are in grains. Um, so they still block your nutrient absorption. Yeah, block nutrient absorption. They're an, they an anti-nutrient. Yeah, um, grains are mostly carbs. Carbs it, convert to sugar, sugar is bad. Yes, no. Uh, there are these particular kinds of proteins called protease proteins, mm -hmm. which can, uh, proteins do a number of different things. One is they can be broken down and built up into protein in your body so you can make muscle from it. That is a good thing. But proteins can also interact with your natural proteins. And not to go too far down this road because it gets really involved, but um, to, an excessive consumption of particular kinds of protease proteins can interact with your lining of your intestines and make it permeable. Also known as leaky gut syndrome. Leaky gut syndrome. So what happens is the food you eat is coming into direct contact with your uh, blood supply. So not a good thing. Um, yeah, when it's supposed body, to be processed. Yeah, well, because right. what happens is that when you, you've got the tight junctions, is what they're technically mm -hmm. called in your intestines, what happens is when you're eating things like this that um, aggravate it, inflammation does the same thing. Right. Um, it starts to loosen these connections so then like proteins and other things can come out of your gut. And when, like Steve said, when it interacts inside your bloodstream, your body is like, oh God, a foreign invader, kill it. So it starts attacking whatever's been leaking out and when it's proteins it doesn't necessarily know the difference between your gut proteins and your proteins right. so that's why the leaky gut syndrome has been linked to autoimmune disorders because autoimmune disorders are basically your immune systems attacking you right. thinking you are the invader it's very similar to like allergies allergies is your immune system overreacting to a very normal invader right. but autoimmune is attacking yourself right and it's uh, so. autoimmune tends to attack organs and it tends mm -hmm. to attack softer tissues. Right. So uh, easy. <laughs> rheumatoid arthritis, thank you very much. Uh, thyroid mm -hmm. uh, issues, um, your, obviously your small, All the digestive small stuff. digestive stuff, small and large intestine. The only organ that seems to be somewhat immune from uh, autoimmune uh, attack is the liver. It seems to sort of... I think it's just because it regenerates so quickly. Yeah, but... that, that, that's kind of it. But yeah, so um, bread, this especially, and we're going to touch on GMOs another time, but one of the problems with, with our bread in this country is that 
all of the wheat used to make bread here is a GMO. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and it, yeah, GMO was a great idea in theory, but in practice has not been very good. The idea was that they were trying to genetically modify the organisms so that they would produce more food because we, back in the day we were worried about there being too many humans and not enough food. So they did increase the yield, but they fundamentally changed the structure of the food. So it's not good for us anymore. It doesn't, and I mean, like grains and stuff like that weren't great. They were acceptable. They were acceptable, but now they're actually problematic. So that's why if you've ever heard someone go to like, or our friends, uh, Bill and Laura, they mm -hmm. went to uh, Italy for their honeymoon. And they're very reactive. They have Hashimoto's and they're very reactive. And they went over to um, Italy, Italy and Germany. And Germany. And they drank <laughs> beer and they ate bread and pizza and they went crazy, essentially. And they didn't even really gain weight. And they were totally and fine. No adverse side effects. Whereas if, you, if they ate bread products from the United States, they well, both and, react. Strong. And they're so reactive that she actually makes sure that they buy grass-fed beef only. They won't eat grain-fed beef because they do notice she do impact. Eat, there's enough grain passed through that she feels it. That's yeah, weird. so that, yeah, she's just, she's very sensitive, so like. It's very sensitive. But yeah, so that's one of the things that they try to do. So, you know, so it's, their wheat and everything is different over in Europe than it is from here. So like, People that are like, but I want to. Like, then move to Europe. There's, there's, you can't <laughs> eat the crap here. <laughs> or see if you can get, get stuff that's brought here from Europe. Yeah. Um, so the, the question always be, I always get this question from diet clients. So people, people have been eating bread for millions of years. Why is this a problem? We actually have been about 10,000 years. Why, why is, is it so bad for us? Why have we been eating it for so long? Part, part of the, the process, um, one of the reasons why it's bad for us is because it is genetically mm -hmm. modified, but it's also because it's factory farm, factory farm and factory produced. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, grains would be stored in silos and there was no way to protect the grain from uh, fermenting. It was just a natural process of grain. That's where sourdoughs and mm -hmm. other uh, breads like that came from is when you stored grain, it would ferment a little bit. The fermentation actually cuts back on some of the things that we're talking about that are, that are in there. It breaks down those protease proteins. It, um, it basically dissipates some of the phytic acid. And then if you sprout those grains, it absolutely changes the, 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 the process of it. So if you can eat grain products that are made from sprouted and fermented grains. Oh Put your hands down. <laughs> I can't help it. Wait, there's an angel, there's an angel. Okay. <laughs> All right, it'll calm down in a second. If, yeah, Sorry. If, if you can, if you can use, if, there we go. if you can use sprouted and fermented grains to to make your bread, <laughs> um, you even folks like us who are reactive to bread, we can eat that bread mm -hmm. and we don't have a reaction to yeah, it. Yeah, we have uh, actually. Uh, you guys know Tony from the dojo. Um, he got some uh, flour or whatever. Yeah. I'm not sure. He got it from Italy and he made pizza and he brought it to one of our uh, uh, party nights with the kids and he made us one with the special. Uh, grain and imported grain. We could actually eat it, and we had no problem, even with the dairy, <laughs> like because it's just everything's different over there. The way that we grow things, which again is a whole another conversation we could spend Careful, all night. Thomas will move back. <laughs> right, take us with you. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so it, that's one of the other things that's wrong with the, the grains. And then the final one is, as everybody knows, our favorite friend, gluten. Um, so gluten is a protein that's in mm -hmm. grains, and what happens is that it's very pro-inflammatory, yes. and so it causes a lot of intestinal damage, and then your body starts to react and blah, 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 like we've talked about. So what can happen is that most people are like, it's kind of like dairy. Everyone's a little bit reactive to it, but some people are more reactive, and what can happen is you can develop a, a bad sensitivity to it, too. So that's why the whole gluten-free craze is now a thing is because right. people recognize how damaging gluten can be. And then you've got people who are actually like celiac who literally can't, they're allergic to it. Yeah. We're not allergic. We're not celiac, but we're very sensitive to gluten. So like if we are going to cheat with something, we have to make sure that it is actually gluten-free. If we do something that's not gluten-free, we will both feel it because we're sensitive to the gluten. But on the other hand, gluten isn't the only protein. No, there's uh, it, 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 the biochemists in the room. <laughs> um, there's a whole string of proteins in bread 
gluten is the one that most people are the most reactive to, mm -hmm. but there's a whole bunch of other closely related proteins that you could react to. Mm -hmm. This is why there are people out there who are very sensitive to gluten when they eat it, but when they go and get tested, uh, excuse me, sensitive to bread, but when they go and get tested, they're not gluten sensitive. Well, they could be glutenase sensitive or any one of 25 other proteins they could be sensitive to mm -hmm. that we don't bother to test for because so few people react to that particular protein. Right, so that's why if you have digestive issues, we recommend going grain-free, not just gluten-free. Right. Like gluten-free is a great step, but if you have a problem and it's not just with gluten, right. you're not gonna know until you cut it out. And I are, we both already know from experience that we are not just gluten sensitive. There's, or, or we've eaten a couple of contaminated things that lie. But, um, but <laughs> liar. we, liar. But we, um, we've had gluten free stuff and we're like, well, you know, eh, we'll take a chance on it because I'm really, I have a hankering mm -hmm. for like gluten free pizza or something like that. And we've had a couple times mm -hmm. where we've really not done well and we're, oh God, mm -hmm. my stomach, that was a mistake. And so, I don't know. I, I, so we must be sensitive to some of the other proteins. And gluten-free gluten does not mean grain-free. Yeah, no, that's what I was trying to get across. Yeah. So you want to go grain-free as yeah. in like none of that, not even gluten-free. You want to be grain-free. You will find uh, sorghum, um, mm -hmm. MRF, yeah, even rice flours. Some people can, you can be reactive to these things because they are grain flours. Uh, they're not, they're, uh, oat flour, for instance. Mm -hmm. You, they don't uh, have gluten in them, but they're still a grain. And if you're sensitive to grains, you're still going to feel it. I, for instance, I can't have oatmeal at all. I, could, I definitely react to the oats, mm -hmm. even though they're gluten free. So right, that's why. So like when uh, like I got a, a young lady into the office, and we're working on her digestive issues, and she is celiac, mm -hmm. but also still has a bunch of digestive problems. And I started looking at her diet diary, and I saw she's eating bread. Uh, basically every meal every single day and I was like I appreciate that this is gluten-free bread but you're obviously sensitive to grains otherwise you wouldn't have these many mm -hmm. problems and she's not eating a lot of like she's not really eating beans and stuff like that so it's just like you know so the real test really is cutting it out for about 90 days mm -hmm. technically so and then this is the last thing I want to say about gluten if you want to see if you're really sensitive to grains and or gluten you have got to go grain or gluten, preferably grain free for six months. It takes six months to really turn over the lining in your, in your digestive tract fully. Usually it takes, so most things like 30 days is a great start. It's never enough, but it's a good start. Um, usually people feel better within 30 days. So it's enough to keep going. 60 days is kind of like the minimum for any sort of uh, program. 90 is ideal. Because 90 days is how long it takes to flip over a red blood cell. So it's, that's how long it takes to really start mm -hmm. to make true biochemical changes in your body. Six months is what it takes to really redo your lining. So if you want to really experiment, if you want to find out for sure, can you tolerate this stuff, you can go grain-free for six months and then try it. See what happens. Right. I bet you won't like it. That's what happened with me. Uh, and we'll tell another parent's story. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So my parents like this uh, Mexican restaurant called Margarita's. Um, I've never liked Mexican food, and now that I am uh, I'm discovering all these things about myself, I understand why. Because it's, it's cheese, beans, and grains. <laughs> like, I like tequila, <laughs> but the rest of it... It's, uh, it's paleo because it's made from a cactus. Right. And we're going to go with that. <laughs> made from a cactus. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, <laughs> so you eat cactus. I'll kill you. <laughs> so we uh, we went to Margaritas because they liked the place and it was nearby. Mm -hmm. um, so we went, and uh, was I was known as being very picky when I was younger. Again, I'm realizing now a lot of it was actually food sensitivities that we didn't realize I had. Um, <laughs> that's all I'll say there. And so I've realized that I don't react well to some of these things. So as I've gone paleo or primal. Mm -hmm and then clearing them out, feeling better. So I had been eating uh, paleo for probably a year by the time we went out, and um, I decided to be a grown-up and get the fajitas, because um, I didn't want them making fun of me the entire meal. So I got the fajitas, <laughs> and I got two margaritas, and I was like, okay, that was good. Um, <laughs> well, you have to do margaritas. <laughs> so No beans? 
No grains? No, no beans. I, I don't do beans anyway. I mean I, in the margarita. Or in the margarita, yeah. No, and I so I was like, well, this will be fine. And normally I can do two drinks and still drive after eating and, you know, hanging out for an hour. So I got in the car and halfway home I was like, oh, my God, I just oh, I don't feel great. And when I got home, it was like I was hungover. I was so like, what the? Ugh. So I lay down and took a nap for like an hour and I woke up and I was like, that was like a hangover. And I was like, I don't think I drank that much. I don't know. Oh, I drove. Uh, so next time I went, I was like, well, I'm not going to have any margaritas because obviously I didn't react well to the margarita. Maybe it was the sugar. So, okay. So then I decided <laughs> no margarita, just drank water, had some corn chips like I did last time, had the fajitas again. Same thing happened about halfway home. I was like, Oh my God, I feel sick. I don't feel good. I laid down for an hour, felt better. And I was like, there was no margaritas involved. <laughs> and I was like, are you telling me? that the two little wheat wraps I had with the fajita, because I didn't eat the whole thing. I can't, I never finish a meal, they're too big. But are you telling me that the two little wraps I had was enough to do this to me? I was like, this is BS. So I was like, I'm gonna experiment next time. So then we went to margaritas again. <laughs> and I was like, screw it. I had two margaritas. <laughs> I had some corn And chips. nothing else. And nothing else. <laughs> no, and then I got the chicken fingers and fries and I was like, I don't care if they make fun of me. I'm eating chicken fingers and fries. Fine, perfectly fine. That's with breaded chicken fingers, some corn chips, and two margaritas. Fine. So I know definitively that I am very reactive to wheat. Um, and so I've I haven't really done the fajitas again, <laughs> obviously. Clearly. Clearly, I'll eat it. I'll eat it just off the plate. Um, I think I tried the corn wraps once, and I'm not as reactive to corn, even though it is still a grain. I don't mm -hmm. react as much to corn, but. He reacts super strong to corn, but not as much to wheat. I react very strongly to wheat and not as much to corn. So that's one of the other things is you got to kind of figure out about your body is corn what, hates me. What can you tolerate? Yeah, like if he has more than like three corn chips, uh, he just is his um, hands and stuff will bother him. Yeah. So I get I get, I get uh, joint pain from eating corn chips. It's bizarre. Right. Well, it's just because that his with his uh, history of autoimmune, it's everybody's a little bit more reactive, a little bit more sensitive to different things. So that's another reason why it's like, there's no one size fits all. Like there is no grains, no legumes, no dairy, no sugar. Right. That, that's, but, a, that's a starting off point. And once you get clear of all that stuff, you can experiment for mm -hmm. yourself to see what things you can and can't eat. But the other thing is I'm, I'm coming up on my 10 year anniversary on eating paleo. And for the majority of that time, except for Maybe the last three years, I ate no grains. I ate <laughs> what no, happened three years ago, Steve? I don't know, Janine. Something came into my life and <laughs> brought some grains and beans with it. But uh, <laughs> he moved in. <laughs> yeah, literally, literally you know, I went. I went close to close to seven, eight years. Zero grains, zero beans, zero dairy, and I never once was sitting at home going, "Oh my God, what will I eat?" No. Like, oh no, I get to have steak and bacon and lobster again. Steak, ch ch steak, chicken, any vegetable you want, right? It, I realize it, it, it's a challenge when you go out because they put grains, beans, and dairy because they're cheap. Yeah, that's why filling. they're so big. Not because they're good for you, because they're cheap. They're cheap. <laughs> they're cheap. Um, we have one last category of uh, foods, right, to, to talk about? Well, this is the what else. So what else causes inflammation slash disease, Steve? Um... You know, <laughs> stuff. Um, well, we already hit on the GMO thing, and we're going to, like I said, we're going to have to do a full thing on okay. GMOs. That's yeah. a huge conversation. Right. But GMOs, just understand that if it's made in a lab, it's not good for you. Mm -hmm. The research done, not by Monsanto, shows definitively that it causes cancer. Yeah. And um, yeah. GMOs are banned in many, many countries. Right. We are one of the few countries still allowing GMOs. And it's because Monsanto owns the FDA, essentially. Yeah. But it, not that I care or know anything about no that. No political opinions here of any kind. Yeah, no, even I think it was Japan. They, when they banned GMOs, they're like, we'll just wait and see what happens in the U.S. with those GMOs. Uh, I think it was 2003, the country of Hungary, um, they found Monsanto patented soy in their soy crop. Mm -hmm. So they burned it. All of it. The entire nation's supply of soy. They burned it rather than eat it. American mm -hmm. soy is illegal in the European Union. Yeah. You can't eat it. Because one of the, again, we can talk about GMO all night, but GMO is one of the problems with them 
is because they grow so much like better, they kind of take over. So mm -hmm. if something gets contaminated, it just starts to grow and, um, it's in, there's no way to like really sort it. They're little seeds, you know what I mean? And, um, so once you get a GMO contamination, that's one of the reasons why it really should have been banned the minute. Um, can you scoot back over here? Yeah. You keep getting the lights all angry. But um, this way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but will be back there in the next two minutes. They should have banned the GMOs when it first started, when they first suspected this, because one of the problems is that as it's going around the world, it blows around the world, it starts contaminating the various continents. So it's good that like Europe and stuff have banned it because it'll spread around Europe more easily. Where our GMOs are starting to leach into Mexico, they have a huge variety of- They should build a wall. <laughs> they should, a really high one. <laughs> Plexiglass or something. <laughs> they closed our border. <laughs> and make us pay for it. <laughs> I'd make us pay for it. It's our fault GMOs are contaminating their crops. But they have a lot of different corn varieties and their corn varieties are not as unhealthy as our no. like two GMO corn varieties. Um, but what they're starting to find is that the GMOs from Monsanto are traveling down and they're contaminating their crops and ruining their heritage corn. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's sad because unless they, like unless they save their seeds somewhere, they're, they're gonna be contaminated and gone. Yeah, they li literally are, are looking to preserve heirloom seeds because they're getting, they are thinking, lost to Monsanto corn and mm -hmm. other And once, other we, once we lose them, right. you know, it's, I don't know how we'd ever get it back. Right. Um, but yeah, so GMOs are a huge problem. Another problem, which is another reason we're pro primal paleo is if you just eat real food, as in like food that came off of a tree or out of the ground or an animal, like if you eat real that food. That came off of a tree or right? <laughs> The cat came off a tree. <laughs> um, if, if your cow comes up out of the ground, <laughs> Don't eat that. Yeah, that's a zombie cow. Uh, <laughs> zombie cow. <laughs> zombie cow. <laughs> that's like that South Park game. Yeah, anyway. Really <laughs> so um, if you eat food that's been processed, it most likely has preservatives in it because how do you get it from the factory to wherever it's going? Preservatives mm -hmm. are known to be problematic. Again, we're gonna I'm gonna have to do a whole talk on this too. Again, there's so much to talk about. Because preservatives are not only in food, they're also in personal care products, like we've talked about a bit, Don. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you think happens when you eat them? So All good things. All good things. <laughs> so those are a problem. Artificial ingredients, um, like food colorings, food dyes, food additives, things that are there to like stabilize and texture, texture and, and, and yes. <laughs> flavor enhancers. Like, right. All of that no, stuff good. is not good. Um, the uh, yellow lake and stuff like that, the food colorings, the dyes in particular, are linked to ADHD in children, which means that it's either causing inflammation, neuro damage, or both. So that's one of the reasons why if your child is hyperactive, one of the best things you can do is put them on like primal paleo. Because mm -hmm. if, you, if you do that, you cut out all these inflammatory foods and then all this other garbage. Right. Um, like I said, GMOs, the best thing you can do is get a child off of GMO. How are they gonna develop? Why do you think girls are having their periods at like eight? I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but I blame Aren't you glad you have a boy? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but now, yeah. now, if he gets his period at eight, then you know you have a problem. Bigger problems. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but it's um, between the GMOs, the hormones in the milk, the preservatives, et cetera, it's, it's starting to really mess with the kids. So that's a problem. Right. Yeah, um, processed foods are a problem, period. If it's made in a factory, it's best, uh, if you possibly can, it's best to avoid it. If it, it. it comes I, out of a bag, a box. A bag, a box, or a wrapper. Um, can I tell you quickly about the presentation I did? Oh, yeah. I was asked to do a presentation <laughs> at a morning business meeting group. Uh, they had me come in to talk about uh, <laughs> this, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, you... Don't ask him. <laughs> don't, don't. If you, I mean, this is, if you ask me, I'm going to tell you, and you might not like what I say. So I, I, while I was getting ready to be introduced and start my talk, I was looking around the room and almost everybody had in front of them a plastic container of yogurt and or a plastic wrapped granola bar. Right. So I walked up and I said, who agrees with this statement? You should never eat processed foods. Put, put your hand up. Boom. Okay. Who in this room tries to avoid processed foods whenever they can? Every hand went up. Boom. Said, look at the food that you have in front of you. Where do you think that was made? 
<laughs> right? <laughs> and read the ingredient list to me. And, and when you get to when you get to something that is not recognizable as a food product, raise your hand. Everyone in the room. So we know we shouldn't eat processed foods. Mm -hmm. We absolutely are positively convinced that that processed and factory made foods are bad. Yet, if it ha if the label has a sunrise on it and says wholesome, we can dismiss that piece of knowledge because the manufacturer told us it was good for us. Yeah, the advertising is very powerful and they've done a very good job of convincing people that things in wrappers and tins and stuff like that are okay. Which they which they will readily tell you is bad for you, they will eat. And in fairness to people, I don't this sounds awfully um, awfully uh, elitist and I don't mean to be that way. They spend trillions of dollars a year to convince you to buy these foods. Mm -hmm. Literally trillions. The craft which is one of the largest food processing com companies on the planet, um, their budget for marketing is larger than the gross national product of most of the countries in the world. Right? Yeah. So if you, if you have false belief that's been implanted by the repetition of a marketing message, that makes you a human being. I, yeah. don't, I don't want anyone to feel like we're judging you for that. No. I ate that stuff until, if it didn't cause me pain to eat it, I probably never would have discovered that I shouldn't. Well, uh, how would you? Right. You know, it's it's generally health problems are what make you realize like, oh, this isn't working. <laughs> right. But no, they, they spend a lot of money to to pad science to prove their points and right. to hide things. And um, they recently started changing uh, uh, high fructose corn syrup. Uh, we were going to talk about that, and then I forgot again. Um, <laughs> Don't eat it. <laughs> yeah, don't eat it. Um, long story short, fructose mm -hmm. is a toxin. It's not really sugar. Um, your body doesn't really know what to do with it. It, it treats it like a toxin, like alcohol. It's processed in the liver. And when you eat a lot of fructose, especially high fructose corn syrup, it causes fatty liver disease. Yes. So, and then fatty liver disease is one of the ways to get to metabolic syndrome yeah, very quickly. One of the constituents in metabolic syndrome. So high fructose corn syrup is um, basically, as everybody knows, it's in like soda and stuff like that, but they put it in everything. And they spent a lot of money lobbying, and I think they were successful in getting it changed. So now they don't have to call it high fructose corn syrup because too many people know what that yeah, is that now. Is, yeah. They changed it to corn sugar. So if you read a label and it says corn sugar, you need to understand that that means high fructose corn syrup. Right. So they are actively, every time you learn a new piece of information, they go and they change it on you. Mm -hmm. Specific, they, um, with GMOs, for example, people got smart to GMOs. Now they they hide it and stuff. They spent a lot of money. I think there was actually an election or the something over in California. They were trying to. This was a couple of years ago. They were trying to force the labeling of GMOs, and they're in the GMO companies were like, "But that would hurt our business." And it's like, mm -hmm. I don't give a shit. <laughs> right. I really don't. Like, if if you are proud of what you offer, you should be standing behind it. Say your GMO. But so many people know how bad GMO is. They're trying to avoid it. So they've changed it, and I, because you have to get actually really tricksy with it. Like you know, um, when you get like a piece of fruit and it has a little sticker on it, and the PLU, the plu. Um, so it has a number, and uh, a couple of years ago, you could look at it, and if the last couple of digits were this, it was GMO. If it was that, it's right. organic. You could tell by the so digits. So you could tell by the digits. They changed it. They changed it <laughs> specifically because they knew informed customers were avoiding. We're figuring it out. Yeah. So that's the other thing is that. Even if you learn this information, they are constantly going out of their way to deprive you of information so you can't make better choices. It's one of the reasons for very pro-local farms because especially if they say- You know who's selling you your GMO. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, you, you should still make sure that they're GMO free, but you know the chances of them lying, I think, are a little bit smaller. It's, it's a little less. So a, a great, along the lines of diet, not, not, not totally off Sorry, topic Sorry, we could talk about this all night. But, um, there's a bit of wisdom, and whenever people find out what I do, it's, it's funny, um, a karate instructor, diet coach, is when people find out what I do, they either want to teach me how to fight. <laughs> That's my favorite. Oh, yeah, tell Steve how to fight. I want yeah. to see this. <laughs> Let's if I, go. If I, if I weren't so calm a man. <laughs> um, yeah, teach me everything they know about fighting. Thank you for that. 
or the other is teach me all their diet tricks that work oh, so well for them. Those are my favorite. It's yes, usually, please, please tell me. It's in normally, no, not to be unkind, not to be unkind, but it's normally someone who outweighs me, who's shorter than me but outweighs me by 50 pounds, wants to tell me their diet tips. Mm -hmm. And you've heard this one, shop around the periphery of the, don't go down the aisle, shop around the outside. We've all heard that, right? The next time you're in Market Basket, stop and it's, shop. Tell me what's on the periphery, I wanna know. Take another look at what's on the periphery. The ice cream is on the periphery. Mm -hmm. The bakery is on the periphery. Yeah, they've, that, they've changed it. The Market Baskets have been remodeled mm -hmm. to put the very cheap, but very appealing things on the outside, specifically to sell them to you, because they know that you've all heard from your grandmother to shop around the outside. Yes, every every single again, every single time the public becomes aware of like a strategy or some information, they go out of their way to change they, it. They adapt to it as 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 good capitalists should. That's what they should do, but it's up to us to stay ahead of their marketing curve if we possibly can. Well, right? again, that's why like people think that like primal paleo is tough. It's not really that hard and when you really get the ideas what can you eat? Vegetables, fruits, meats, nuts. Nuts. You can eat all that. <laughs> I like to get to nuts. You do have to go down the center aisle. You can't. Those aren't. Those are rarely on the outside. You have to go down the center right. aisle. So like, so the the periphery isn't as as big as it used to be. And spices are down the middle of the aisle. Those okay. are okay. Right. Like, but you should be able to go through an aisle and like, I can walk down the candy aisle. I can walk down the the cereal aisle. And eat everything. <laughs> I don't go down those aisles because they're usually filled with people with children who aren't moving and it's just too crowded. <laughs> but like, I will go down these aisles and I'm not tempted because I know there's nothing for me here. Um, but yeah, but if you're, if like, here's a lime, here's a potato, like if you can, if you know what it is, then you don't have to worry about this stuff as much. It's not this as big true. a deal. This is true. And then the last couple of things that can also cause inflammation, which can then kill your immune system, this one will be unsurprising. Alcohol. <laughs> well, because alcohol breaks down the sugar. <laughs> um, so if you feel like you're catching a cold, um, you don't want a nightcap, drink some more water, preferably warm water with lemon. Mm -hmm. That will help you out more than taking some alcohol. Alcohol will actually, like, if you're on the verge of getting sick, it'll make you sick. Alcohol will make you sick if you're not on the verge of making you <laughs> sick. <laughs> yeah. Like, but isn't it a disinfecting? Can we like look into injecting? It is kind of a disinfecting. Can we like inject it's a that? Way of injecting. Does anybody? Oh boy. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but... <laughs> wow. Um, we don't have any particular leaning at all. <laughs> obviously, um, obviously, alcohol processed alcohol is a toxin in the body. Well, yes. Furthermore, it's a toxin. <laughs> and your liver prioritizes the um, the conversion of alcohol from a dangerous toxin into uh, a neuro substances, it prioritizes that because it has to. You could die. Because you could <laughs> die. Um, so it, it, that means your liver for most of its other functions get suppressed or even shut down depending on how much uh, you're drinking. Mm -hmm. So the li liver right. plays a, a role in digestion, in uh, hormone regulation as we know, uh, appetite regulation and uh, regulation of immunity is, is in there too. Yeah, so, a little bit of everything. And then if you add in, like I said, about the fructose, which I meant to spend more time on, the fructose, like I said, is treated basically like alcohol. It has to be cleared out by the liver. So if you're doing like my one of my favorites, a rum and coke, <laughs> it's like a one-two punch. What's rum, made, what's rum made out of? Coke. <laughs> molasses. molasses. What's molasses made of? Sugar. Sugar. <laughs> yeah, so no. So like I said, it's one of my favorite things, but I try to have it sparingly because between the high fructose corn syrup and then the alcohol that's actually straight up made from sugar too, it's not even like anything else. Um, right. When you put those together, it's extra that your body has to do. If you do like a Mai Tai, again, one of my favorites is why I'm listing them. Mai Tai's um, not the traditional Trader Vic's one, but the classic Asian one that you get at the at the restaurant. Restaurants. Yeah. I was like that we make at home sometimes too. Um, it's pineapple juice, it's <laughs> orange juice, it's uh, rum. 
uh, cream de cacao or yeah, yeah uh, Lopez. orange curacao. So it's all, let me rephrase. It's made with some sugar, mixed with some sugar, on top of some sugar with some sugar. Right. Yeah. When you start adding fruit juice or soda yeah. to your alcohol, it's one of the worst things you can actually do. Don't get me wrong. It's one of my favorites, but it's one of the worst things you can do. <laughs> um, that's why I like it. So again, talking about good, better, best, <laughs> if your worst would be mixed drinks. Also down there, I would put beer in there. Sorry, Thomas. Because it's made from wheat. <laughs> well, it's great. It, it has it has grains in it, whether it exactly. be a, a wheat or barley or both. Um, yeah. Then next up the ladder, I would say probably like cider, because at least it's made from apples, but apples are still fruit, which is still sugar. And most ciders have extremely high sugar content. Yeah. So I would like there, yeah. and then you know maybe some other things, and then here's where we get into like sipping that alcohol plain and wine, dry red wine. That those are probably the best ones. The white wines and the sweet reds are more in the middle. They still have a lot of sugar. The other problem with wines is like sulfites and stuff like that. Again, we could help. we should do a whole alcohol one. That'd be cool. We um, should drink while we do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's other things in it, but dry red wines have less sugar in them. Um, you can get like bone dry wines, which have no extra carbs. Ketowines.com. You can actually yeah. find wines that are so low in sugar, they're considered zero sugar. Yeah, if again, must, right. alcohol still converts to sugar ultimately, so it doesn't matter how much is not added to it, but if you're going to drink more sugar water, at least do the least sugary <laughs> sugar water. Right. Like, if you're going to choose between a glass of red wine and a Coke, you should probably choose the red wine, not honestly. And, the, um, and as we know, and we may do this at some point when we do the alcohol thing, mm -hmm. there are some positive benefits to the consumption yeah. of alcohol, both uh, in, in, in moderation as far as stress relief, blood pressure reduction, reduction in heart disease. Yep. Um, well, there's um, a component in red wine called resveratrol, and it is known as like an antioxidant, anti-aging sure. type of thing. But we also sell a supplement that has resveratrol in it, so you don't actually have to drink if you it's don't want to. It's not as good over ice as the no. wine. <laughs> crush, 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 crush. It's not. It's not <laughs> You're killing them. Sorry. But yeah. So that's the, the skinny on alcohol. And then the last one is coffee. Coffee is... <laughs> Sorry. Coffee is basically acid water. <laughs> yeah. um, and don't get me wrong. We drink... Well, I drink coffee every day. He doesn't as I much. I drink about a half a cup a day now. Down, down from, if you knew me 15 years ago, I basically just got up in the morning, made a gallon, and put in the IV. <laughs> I just drank coffee constantly. Um, I don't yeah. know how I survived it. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> yeah, so coffee um, can play havoc with your body as well. It's a, it's a bit inflammatory, but again, kind of like alcohol. If you're doing it kind of in moderation and you're doing good ki kinds of coffee, like try to stick with organic coffees, um, you got to be careful about stuff that's imported from various uh, South American countries. And same thing with wine. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I want to do a whole thing on this. Because um, some South American countries will allow people to spray chemicals uh, onto the crops and stuff like that. That includes coffee and wine, like grapes. grapes yeah. So what happens is that it's not like they can clean it off. So it's, when they squeeze it down, it's in the wine, it's in the, mm. the coffee. So you want to buy organic, uh, trade-free, uh, free trade. Free trade, um, yeah, that organic. Kind of stuff. And now there's a, there's a because, because we know more and more about this, there's a number of coffees that are actually considered toxin free. Mm -hmm. They're tested to be toxin free. Uh, bulletproofcoffee.com. Uh, Dave Asprey actually markets his own. Oh, you, and you can buy it on Amazon. It's called Bulletproof Coffee. It's guaranteed toxin free. Uh, it's also, if you ever have a toxin free coffee, you'd be surprised at what it tastes like. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. It's but really yeah, good. and then the other thing too is like, what do you do to your coffee? Because just so everyone knows, lattes are. Throw it against the wall. <laughs> Lattes aren't <laughs> coffee. They're not. They're That's milk. Not serving a milk with a little over coffee. which the word coffee was gently whispered. <laughs> exactly. So if you're drinking coffee, coffee, that's one thing. But if you're doing coffee-like drinks from a place with the Green Mermaid on it, that they may not really be coffee. They may have added sugar. We're again, we're not going to get mad at you. Regardless, but, I don't have anything. but you, the people, you do you, but sometimes people go like, but oh my God, but I have sugar in my coffee. Like, please, are you, are you doing like, are you pouring your coffee into the sugar glass or <laughs> like, you know, how much coffee, how much sugar and milk are you really putting in your coffee? I if have. you're doing like a teaspoon and you're only having one or two cups a day, I'm not concerned. Sure. 
I had a client of mine, a young man, who was, was one of the most um, narrowest palates I've ever met. The guy just didn't eat anything. But he would get the venti, venti frappuccino caramel coconut. <laughs> it, it basically, it was an ice cream sundae on top of a gallon of coffee. It was ridiculous. And he got one or two of these things a day. He was in a very physical job, and he said, I need the energy. I said, dude, like, I got, don't eat bread. Bread's all I eat. You shouldn't eat beans. Beans are all I eat. All I eat is peanut. He ate peanut butter and bread. <laughs> oh, he sprinkled chemicals on it. And he, I mean, just... <laughs> All he had uh, in his in his diet was things he shouldn't eat, and he really would not eat things that that I had recommended to him. He didn't even like he he'd eat a burger from McDonald's, but he wouldn't eat a burger if his wife made it at home because he was he was like skeeved out by homemade food. It was weird. You shouldn't be way more skeeved out by restaurant food, by the way. So I got him to uh, I got him to give up the the frappo chino things and just have coffee. And to reduce it from a venti down to like a grande, right? For so we're talking from 20 ounces down to about uh, 12 ounces. And he lost. It took him about eight weeks to lose 20 pounds, just by not consuming all of the sugar and additives that he put into his coffee. And one last thing on coffee, Thomas, you you will bear this out. If you go to Europe, traditional servings of coffee in Europe are are very small yeah, very They're tiny small. <laughs> the, the Europeans seem to intuitively understand that they haven't lost the food traditions like we have right well they here it's America bigger is better I don't know why anybody needs a five gallon drum of coffee I don't want I don't understand you go <laughs> to Duncan you need a backpack with a hose to carry the thing it doesn't make sense but if you go to France Germany Belgium uh, Italy the, the, the coffee servings are very, 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 especially Italy, they're, they're, it's a thimble, you know? The mm -hmm. tiny, tiny, tiny little servings because they realize that's all you really should have of that. It's right. enough. Yeah, and we won't get into the caffeine part tonight, but caffeine also can cause some... Um, it's good for me. It can cause <laughs> some issues, and some people are very caffeine sensitive, as you can see. <laughs> so, so you should be a little <laughs> careful with that. But if you get, like organic coffees like we have a place up in uh salem new hampshire mm. called coffee coffee they're that name again coffee coffee coffee, coffee. coffee. they're cute um <laughs> they're the, adorable. The, uh, the owners are great but they do a really good job of trying to source really good coffee and a lot of it is naturally decaf like it just doesn't have a lot of caffeine in it so he can actually drink that stuff and he's better <laughs> i'm okay i'm okay I'm whereas like I'm a fast caffeine, like we did a, a DNA test. He's a slow caffeine processor, so slow, it builds up. And, <laughs> so it builds up in his system and he can't clear it out fast enough. So if he has a little too much coffee, a little too fast, or a little too strong of a coffee, he gets like way <laughs> hyper. Whereas like I'm a fast processor, so I can drink coffee and be like, all right, I'll see you after my nap. <laughs> and I'll just go lay down. And I'm drinking some stuff called Death Wish. Um, I love it. I love the taste of it, but I also know it's not ideal for me. I will be honest. I it is fortified with caffeine. It's fortified with caffeine. <laughs> it doesn't affect me at all, <laughs> but because I'm a fast caffeine processor, but I'm, I'm <laughs> at the point where like, we're trying to be a little bit better. I'm almost done with all of it. And, uh, I'm wondering, I think I might just go coffee free. Right. Cause I, I'll be honest right now, especially with the mask at the office, I'm not able to First of all, drink enough water in a day because I used to drink a whole water bottle at the office, but now it's just like this was, uh, this is, so this is liquid death. This is water um, that we've been drinking. It's 16 ounces. I just downed this in an hour because I'm dying of thirst because I was there at the office unable to drink anything. Thomas from Austria. Yeah, so it's, it's, min Austria. it's mineral water. Um, so it's, um, it's Vina. <laughs> but yeah, so at the office, I barely get through my, my coffee anyway. So I'm like, it's kind of a waste because I can't save it for the next day. So I'm also like, just right now, it's not necessarily practical, but. We but, should do, we should do a, another session one day just on the health effects of coffee, positive and negative. It, mm -hmm. it actually, small amounts of coffee are actually not that bad for you. Mm -hmm. It can be, have some really positive effects. Yeah. If, well, if you did, like, think about Europe. If you did the small little espresso in the morning and you did a glass of vino with dinner at night as long as you say caffeine as long as you say alcohol and coffee in italian they're healthy exactly and then you do the non-gmo <laughs> pasta and pizza you know like there's a 
you know, that's why they uh, they're fine over there. Like the French people are always like, but shouldn't they be fat with all the croissants and the butter? And it's like, well, their bread and their butter are different. Right. And then another another time we'll go into we talk we talk a little bit on this show about cholesterol. Um, you look at the way the French t- traditionally eat um, that the highest one of the highest fat diets on the planet, one of the lowest instances of heart disease at the same time. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, the, the correlation between fat consumption and heart disease is not a one-to-one, just as all, as all of these things are. We'll, we'll, we'll dig into all of that stuff. But, but on that note. On that note, pro-inflammatory foods, grains, beans, dairy, for the most part, any processed food. Um, sugar. Uh, sugar, excess alcohol, and excess caffeine are all to be avoided. Yes, because they all can kill your immune system over time. And right now, your best defense. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, you can have a tomato and some tuna fish for dinner. That's it. <laughs> Not even a tomato. That's a nightshade. <laughs> but um, your best defense is a good offense. If you can proactively get rid of some of these things from your diet, I am sure that you'll notice positive health benefits, maybe even a slimmer waistline or an increased one if that's what you need. Uh, your body will reach homeostasis, um, but it'll boost your immune system because I I, I do really think that uh, exposure to coronavirus is a matter of when, not if. Um, and you just why not have the best team on your side ever? Your own body. Us. Oh, I mean, what she's right. <laughs> that too. <laughs> Uh, all right it's getting violent time well, to go <laughs> next week we'll be back on tuesday the 14th at seven to talk about sleep Woo. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to demonstrate sleep next week <laughs> yeah you can watch us sleep for an hour <laughs> cleo not, could sleep for an hour pretty, it's not, she's right out there, she's right out there. All so right, guys well, then, thanks for being here yes and don't forget as always like and subscribe to our channel, new videos are coming out and we have other ones that are not a part of the immune webinar series that are coming out. So we'll see you next time.